Good morning everyone, welcome to our time of worship in the benefits of St Aldelm and uh, we look forward this morning to Nick giving his, uh, his um, maiden sermon for us in the benefice. Now much has been going around about the reopening of churches and our church wardens have been working very hard, especially John and Michael. They've been producing risk assessments longer than your arm and uh, just to make sure all is safe. The plans at the moment are that as from this Wednesday we will meeting at 10 o'clock in Langton at St George's at 10 o'clock um, and the church will be open until 11 so those who wish to stay behind after morning prayer for a time of private personal prayer are very welcome to do so. There's the possibility of opening St George's also either on Saturday afternoon or on Sunday morning. Um, that will depend upon the responses we've had to the, uh, the brief questionnaire we've sent out. St Edward's will be open for um, morning prayer next Sunday at 8 o'clock and again on Wednesdays between 5 and 7 o'clock for private prayer. The Zoom services will continue so the uh, Wednesday morning service at St George's will be both in church but also on Zoom if we can manage the technology and we'll continue to meet for the time being with this 10 o'clock Sunday service. As you can see um, Michael and Pauline have been very busy getting uh, St George's ready and uh, all the seats have been uh, suitably separated so that all will be will will um, conform to the, uh, the, the the COVID regulations. Now we don't want anyone to feel under pressure to come back to church if they don't feel it's an appropriate thing to do so for them yet. The invitation is there but there is no expectation that people will necessarily come. Um, the choice is entirely up to you. On the website, on the Benefice website, there is some um, material to support our thinking through the issues raised by Black Lives Matter. I put a link on the website to um, a talk that uh, Tom Wright has given as he explores the theological uh, perspectives of Black Lives Matter. So I commend that to you. If you haven't been on the Benefits website, I'm afraid it still has a Purbeck Hills uh, preface, but it is a whole Benefits website, um, there is the, uh, the web address. I do invite you to have a look on there. There is interesting material to be found, and also you can access um, our recent services from the home page of the website. <laughs>
now we have John and Dawn in conversation with Jill and Mike Levens. Hello, Jill and Mike. Hi. Hi there. Hello. I can't see you on the screen, sorry. <laughs> right. we, we can see you. We can see. Oh, that's it. That's it. Um, I, just in, to introduce to everybody that doesn't know them, Mike and Jill Revens, they're, they're the sort of people that you always want in your church because they're always volunteered, I think, probably for every role that there is going in the church. Um, and they're very, very supportive and they're always there. Um, if you want them to do anything from being church warden to Bouncy Castle to cake making to odd job things, there's all sorts of things that they have done. Um, so Jill and Mike, how long have you been in Corf? Um We moved into the house on the 19th of December 2006. I, I might point out that the week before we'd been in Prague because somebody in this house had a big zero birthday uh, <laughs> on on the 8th of January um, in 2007 uh, we were presented with another grandson so it was quite a busy time <laughs> yeah, a busy time and what brought you here um, well my father-in-law had bought the house here in 1978 um, and sadly he died um, aged nearly 89 in 2006 so when we were clearing out the house, ready for a sale, we actually thought, well, I thought especially that the village was lovely. You know, we'd, we'd been down often enough to realise that um, it was a very active village. The Corfe Valley News gave us a lot of information about how, yeah, what a good community spirit it had. And so with retirement on the horizon, we decided to take a gamble and buy the house off the estate and so we put our own house up for sale and a few months later much to our surprise we were down here it pulls you in doesn't it Cor? Yeah. <laughs> um so tell us about yourselves your hobbies and your interests oh yeah that's supposed to be me isn't it yes uh, <laughs> well, we, we have firstly uh, a family of three um a son and daughter in this country, and also uh, a son and his family uh, in New Zealand. Um, and we try and go and see them once a year. Um, my main interest down here has been as a member of what's known as the National Coast Watch Institution, uh, which has lookouts at St Albans Head and also down in Swanage. Um, Jill, despite the rather overstated introduction we were given. Um, Jill's the person who's been church warden and involved in flower arranging and all those sort of things. Um, and I guess I've been involved in things like uh, Bouncy Castle, which is an extreme... <laughs> it's a role. very vital role, Mike. <laughs> well, uh, for anybody listening who wants to come when we next have one, um, our price is a pound for three minutes, if I've got a queue and a pound for as long as you like if I haven't because it always looks good to the people coming off the train you know with their sons and daughters um, if there appears to be lots going on and if the bouncy castle is full all the kids want to come in so all the parents come in and so hopefully we're then able to uh, um, make some money to keep some Edwards going. <laughs> Well, I have to, have to say, Mike is pointing out that it is children on the back to castle. We haven't got an enormous one for grown-ups yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, too so what, many people who look too enthusiastic, I thought. <laughs> what drew you into the Fellowship of St Edwards? Um, well, it's, it's not, not a story of sort of, what was it, four weddings and a funeral. It's really um, two funerals and a wedding. Um, because with my father-in-law down here, the first time we were actually in the church was to celebrate his third marriage to a lady called Ruth. Um, it was a blessing in the church that was done by um, Morris, I can't remember his other name. Um, and then sadly Ruth died a few years later so we were down here for the funeral. Um, and then 2006 we had a lovely celebration of father-in-law's life um, again at St Edward's. Um, so it just seemed natural. You know, we, we'd like to support the community and we also 
wanted something local and it was just natural to go to St Edward's. Yeah, I, I should say that we had previously attended our, our local churches pretty much everywhere, everywhere we, else where we, we, where lived. we lived. So we, we've always tried to do local. It was, yeah. a, to some extent, a natural uh, evolution. It's nice, it's nice to be able to walk to church too, isn't it? It is, yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So how, how are you managing with the lockdown and this weekend the slight loosening of it? Um, actually, I won't say we haven't noticed the lockdown, but let's be realistic. We live in a, an area uh, where the population density is pretty low. You can walk out the door and you can be on beyond open common land within a few minutes uh, and walk for as long as you like without, um, without endangering social distancing. We've been very lucky in that the weather this year has been fabulous, uh, fabulous quite a lot of the time. Um, and because we're pensioners, we haven't had the same challenges as, as you know, people who are dependent on, the, on their um, work income and, and now there is no work and they're being furloughed and so on. So we, and I guess very many other people, compared with the majority of the country, um, some would say we don't know we're born, you know, it, yeah. It's, yeah. it's been and, a lot and, easier. And would you, at the, I mean, that sort of leads on any particular positive thoughts about lockdown or experiences? Well, um, I mean, my positive thoughts actually has been purely the, the enjoyment we've had, or I've had in um, doing all the garden that's needed doing and having the time to enjoy the pleasure of it. Um, and also, I mean, looking back on this time, I think we will always um, remember that our great granddaughter was born a few couple of weeks ago. Um, so she's, a, you know, a, a new baby um, of, of the lockdown. So I think those, yeah, those, those are the really lovely things. Okay. And, and the value of family and the support we've had from family, that, that's what we'll take from, from lockdown. I think, I think a lot of us would, would say the same and life has slowed and, you know, in some ways we've been very fortunate. To very fortunate, yeah. So, well, thank you very much, Mike and Jill. And over to James to carry on the service. Thank you. And we now continue with our first hymn which is Lord of the Dance.
And if Michael and Pauline ready, we will carry on now with the service. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power. Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now Brenda is going to bring us our scripture reading. The reading is taken from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19, and then 25 to the end. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. But John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Here ends the reading. And now I'm going to Nick, who's going to explore that passage with us. Nick, over to you. Lovely. Thank you, James. Hello. Thank you for having me. A week of firsts. First time as a curate. First time preaching uh, across the, uh, the churches as a curate and the first time doing it through Zoom. So, uh, a special week. <laughs> Today's reading from the book of Matthew is a really interesting one. To start, it's a bit different in the sense that within the whole of chapter 11, Jesus is speaking all the time, which usually suggests a few things. Firstly, what is being said is going to be important and valuable for us to grasp. Secondly, it's undoubtedly going to be challenging because Jesus' teaching always is. But thirdly, if we can get hold of the gist of what is being said, then we're heading in the right direction in our lives. So it's worth persevering with. So what is being said here? Well, I would suggest that if I might risk summarising right at the start, we have a great example of the upside down kingdom of God, of countercultural values of Jesus. Following a service I took several years ago, a lady said to me at the end, it must be lovely to believe, but I can't and she had tears in her eyes. Some of you may remember about 10 years ago, 
there was an advertising campaign run on the sides of buses. It was funded by the humanists and the slogan read, there is probably no God. A statement with an interesting lack of certainty in it. Surveys conducted in the UK regularly show that approximately 60% of people say that they believe in God. This doesn't, of course, translate across the church attendance, but it does raise a big question. Which God, or sort of God, do they believe in? People often have a wide range of answers to offer and ideas as to who or what God is. But I would suggest that it might be more interesting to ask those who claim not to have any belief in God the question, what sort of God do you not believe in? Often this has far more to do with the image of God which they've been presented with by their personal encounters with others, read about in books or seen in media. I suspect that few would want to believe in that God either. So what is our image of God? How would we describe God? 60 years ago, Sixty years ago, J.B. Phillips wrote a book, Our God is Too Small, in which he challenged the images of God that people had as being too narrow or limiting. Thirty years later, John Young wrote the book as a follow-up, Our God is Still Too Small, and expands on Phillips' book by suggesting various images of God that people have, Christians and non-Christians alike. We have the killjoy God, concerned to tell us what not to do. We have the angry God, looking to punish. The lucky charm God, turn to him when we need to for help. We have the silent God, who never seems to hear what we say. We have the biased God, who favours some people only. Demanding God, who just wants us to obey him. The odd job God the one who provides parking spaces or intervenes in trivial ways. The blueprint God, the one with a predetermined plan for our lives which we have no power to change. And of course, the nappy changing God, the one who wants us to stay as babies and never mature. I'm sure that we've heard other images of God too. Maybe we have a different image ourselves. So or an image that dominates when we think of God. I would love to hear these as we get to know each other. The content of chapter 11, which we've heard today, shows us that the people of Jesus's day, from various and contrasting walks of life, were also struggling with their image of God. Both John the Baptist and then Jesus were confusing, as they weren't the way that people expected to see the Messiah arrive. Rather than a powerful display of glory and power, dramatic and undeniably God, they got Jesus, disturbingly different and yet hugely compelling and embraceable to many. The expected mould was broken and for many, the new mould wasn't what they wanted, so it was rejected. Expectation and reality meant that many failed to engage with Jesus and they missed his message of hope, love and grace and that is still true for us today so what inspires or affects our belief in god or our image of god there are probably a number of key issues that affect what we believe our contexts are all unique so it will vary but briefly this morning a couple of thoughts stand out that's creation and suffering. Creation, the question of how the world began, is a big one. I have it regularly uh, as a discussion with my nine and six-year-old sons. For many people, the belief in evolution and belief in a God who made the world are not incompatible. The idea that a world with such beauty, complexity and wonder has a creator is a natural conclusion for many. 
For me, the beauty of gardens speaks of God every day. Creation speaks of God. But what about suffering? Many find it difficult to picture a God when the world is so clearly one of suffering. Tragic deaths, painful illness, poverty, injustice, constant wars, which often seem to relate to religious belief. And of course, the current pandemic of COVID-19. Then there are the actions purporting to flow from religious belief, such as terrorism and martyrs' deaths. These often turn people off God. Alongside suffering, or maybe part of it, are greed, power-seeking, selfish or aggressive behaviour, and broken relationships. Some ask what sort of God allows these things, and thus see them as denying the existence of God, or promoting the image of God which they don't want to believe in. And yet others see the need for a powerful God who can bring change. Some in the midst of suffering turn in desperation to God. As is commonly said, there are no atheists in a lifeboat. In the light of all this, Jesus' words at the end of chapter 11 are a gentle message of grace and hope. Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Learn from me, for I am humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. However, the whole of this chapter is highlighting the reality that in Jesus' day, Jesus didn't live up to people's expectations of what God should look like either. Jesus was in fact exceeding expectation by demonstrating a way of living life to its fullest and teaching of a kingdom of God which turned the expectations of his day upside down. Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus was the revolutionary. Everything he said and did challenged the people of his day, whatever group they were part of, and he still does today. Are Christians seen as revolutionaries? For many, we're seen as simply harmless innocents, like someone who believes in fairies at the bottom of the garden. But when Jesus taught his disciples how to live and how to pray, how to live out the kingdom of God through Beatitudes, and he taught them the Lord's Prayer, a radically different prayer of that day and this day. Listen to what he's saying. Love your enemies, forgive those who harm you, don't judge, give to those who ask. Happy are the poor, the hungry, the meek, the persecuted. He challenged loyalty to family first, warned of the real danger of wealth, said the first shall be last and the last first. He welcomed the dregs of society, he ate with them, partied with them and loved them. And his success and victory were seen in his death on the cross, which everyone saw as failure and defeat. Jesus set out the way of revolution, the way for the world's values to be rejected and the kingdom to arrive, to follow the image of God that Jesus reveals. And of course, if your image of God doesn't look like Jesus, then it isn't God. To follow this image of God is to ask for the world to be turned upside down. It's to live counterculturally. Do we really want that? In Jesus, we see the God who surprises us, the God who does not live up to normal expectations and images of God. In Jesus, we see the one who brings light into the darkness of the world, who enables us to see the world as God sees it who is the light that cannot be put out, no matter what sort of chaos is round us. It's as we look at Jesus and see him as the image of God, that we can begin to shape our image of God and see so many of the other images pushed away. The journey of Jesus and his upside down kingdom, his topsy-turvy ministry, his countercultural living, reaching the conclusion of death and resurrection, shows us a truly 
amazing and wondrous image of God. A God whose greatness is seen not in his power from on high, but in his living among us and the way that that living and dying revealed the extent of his love for his people. As we look to Jesus, we see the image of God. It is with him that we start. It is with him that we stay. And it is with him that we live. Amen. Let us pray. The sacrifice of God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. Let us come to the Lord who is full of compassion and acknowledge our transgressions in penitence and faith. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Yeah.
Now let us say the creed together. He did not, not cling to equality with God, but made, made himself, himself nothing, nothing, taking the form of a slave. He was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. And every, every voice proclaims that Jesus is Lord, is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And now Peter is going to bring us our intercessions. Let us by prayer and intercession offer our thanks and make our petitions to the Lord. Almighty and everlasting God, we thank you that you have brought us safely to the beginning of this new day. Keep us from falling into sin or running into danger. Order us in all our doings and guide us to do always what is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, we thank you for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world through our Lord Jesus Christ, for the inestimable means of grace, and for the sustaining hope of glory. Give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be unfailingly thankful and that we show forth your praise, not only in our lips, but also in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Amen. We give thanks for the life and work of all those whose vision founded our National Health Service and for those who serve others in care and compassion. We pray that their work and ministry to the sick may enrich and support the welfare of all. We pray for all who promote health and well-being in policy and practice, for all who care for the sick in hospital, in care homes and at home, for doctors, nurses, care assistants and cleaners. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind or spirit, for those who are terminally ill, for the elderly, for the frail, for all who live with disability or in constant pain, and for the many who strive to bring comfort and healing to them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for peace, justice, and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honoring of human rights and for the relief of the oppressed. We pray for Ian, for James, for Nick, and for Jane, who lead our worship, and for the life of this benefice. We give thanks for the gift of your word, the grace of the sacraments, and the fellowship of your people. We pray for this local community and for all people who in their daily life and work. We pray for the young and the elderly, for families and all who are alone. We give thanks for human skill and creativity and all that reveals and helps us to understand your creation. Teach us to see you in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. We pray for those who are in need, for the sick, sorrowful and bereaved. We pray for all who bring comfort, care and healing. We give thanks for human love and friendship and for all that enriches our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord, we bring before you our homes, families and communities. The relatives and friends to whom we owe so much and whom we rarely thank. The people we remember with guilt only at Christmas, another year without contact. The school nearby where young lives are being shaped and children prepared for their lives ahead. The neighbours who we haven't got to know. The counsellors who serve our community. May your spirit and blessing rest on each person and place and your kingdom be found within them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we commend unto you the soul of our dear friend, Brian Boreham, long-standing, dedicated and faithful servant of you, our community and our benefice. We ask you to bring comfort to all who mourn his passing, especially the Boreham family. Let us remember all those who we have loved, but whose lives we can no longer share. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty and merciful God, whose son became a refugee and had no place to call his home, look with mercy on those who today are fleeing from danger, who are homeless and hungry. Bless those who bring work to bring relief to them. Inspire generosity and compassion in all our hearts and guide the nations of the world towards that day when people will come from east and from west, from north and from south, and sit at table in your kingdom, and we shall see your Son reveal his glory. Most merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never put it out. Hallelujah. This is the good news. Once we were no people, now we are God's people. Hallelujah. Christ is our peace, the indestructible peace we now share with each other. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. And let us offer one another a sign of that peace. So the peace of the Lord be always with you.
So we come to the blessing. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.